No, thanks, Clark. Thanks, everyone. Um, Clark read my title. These are the uh, funders. Okay. Okay, so I'm sort of talking there's there's lots of traumatic events um, that people think um, are related to post traumatic stress disorder. Um, there's what we're going to talk about here, what I'm going to talk about combat um, related traumatic events, but there's also um, things like natural disasters, um, interpersonal violence. Um, terrorist attacks. Um, but of all these events, combat trauma is kind of weird. Um, in this picture, there are two um, folks who are sitting in these comfortable chairs, and they're looking at a bunch of computer monitors. And what they're doing is um, they're flying drones. And this is the type of setup for people who are flying drones um, in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria. Um, they, they're in a basement somewhere in Nevada. And they're conducting basically combat missions in the air um, in these other countries. And this is a pretty safe environment. There's not really any danger of these folks getting um, killed or injured. And they're, you know, they're, not really, um, they're not really exposed to anything that might cause them harm. And what's kind of weird about this is that you know, people who have done studies with these drone pilots have found that they have a lot of um, symptoms of PTSD um, to the extent of, maybe not infantry troop, but to the extent of um, other combat pilots, um, even though they're nowhere near danger. And I'll be talking about this a little bit when we talk, but it's kind of a weird phenomena. Um, one que another question is, is, is PTSD weird? And this, um, some of you are familiar with, is Western Educated um, Industrial Rich and Democratic Societies. Um, this is a book that was on the bestseller list last year, New York Times bestseller, um, where the author, Sebastian Younger, argues that PTSD is something that's unique to Western societies and um, doesn't occur in smaller scale societies. Um, there are a couple of different perspectives on PTSD and this question about whether um, it's universal or not. Um, there's a couple of books um, by, about this from an evolutionary psychology perspective. Um, Chris Cantor um, has wrote the main one and has done the most work here. And his idea is PTSD is a universal response to a near-death experience and that what it is is an overlearned survival response. So these symptoms of PTSD are there when you're exposed to a traumatic experience to, to um, help you avoid um, having that experience in the future, um, which could be lethal, or um, to learn, learn from that experience. Um, some of the evidence that, that he cites for this are just, there's correlates for PTSD and other mammals um, that people think anyway. Elephants, um, there's a study of chimpanzees, um, some dogs um, that have been abandoned after a nuclear um, reactor a tsunami in Japan, and lots and lots of experiments with, with uh, rodents. Um, it's really hard to tell ask animals what their internal states are, so all these are kind of behavioral coordinates, and this is what some of the evolutionary psychologists think are, are good evidence for this being a universal state. Um, another thing is that it, a lot of the symptoms of PTSD seem to be context independent, which means that all different types of trauma invoke a similar response. And this is kind of the general view for clinicians that treat PTSD is that you know, this is kind of like a universal response to any type of trauma. Uh, medical anthropologists have a little bit different perspective, and what they do is they go and they study um, how PTSD works within the medical system that we have, um, mostly in the United States and in Europe. Um, and they think that PTSD is not timeless or universal, but it's constructed from the socio-political ideas of a specific society. Um, and they'll go through and figure out like where PTSD developed. It developed because people came back from, as a symptom in the medical establishment, because people came back from Vietnam with lots of different issues. And um, psychologists that were treating them, or psychi psychiatrists that were treating them, um, didn't have a way of categorizing their issues, and so they kind of invented this thing called PTSD, which is in the manual of statistical manual, and it gets applied uh, now to in Western societies. Um, Cross-cultural psychologists um, have gone and done work mostly with refu refugees, and they say that societies have their own idioms of distress, and they're not universal, and that you have to go into each society or each culture individually and see how they deal with trauma and take it on their own terms. And so you end up having this conflict between uh, one group that says PTSD is a universal response to traumatic experiences and has deep evolutionary roots, and another set of people who say PTSD is a social construction and maybe it's unique to um, our types of societies. All right, and so one of the problem with all these different ideas and theories is that no one's actually gone into a small scale society and tried to measure combat stress in those societies. And so that's what um, I did in this research. So this is the area that I did my research in. It's um, Turkana County, 
um, with the Trakana people. It's in kind of the northwest corner of Kenya, um, borders Uganda, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. Um, the Trakana people are pastoralists, um, and the main animals they, they raise are camels, um, go cows, sheep, goats, uh, and donkeys, um, which is what they use for, for most of their sustenance. It's also the unit of wealth in, for the Trakana, for the pastoralist Trakana. Um, it's a semi-desert environment. Um, it's fairly dry most of the year. There's a couple of rainy seasons. Um, and during the dry season, often to get water, they have to dig down into a dry riverbed, which is, you can tell by all the vegetation here that this is a riverbed. Um, and they can dig down and get water out of there, which they can use to feed animals. Um, they're also semi-nomadic. Oh, too many slides. They're also semi-nomadic. So this is kind of a, a typical um, home for a Chicana family. Um, they may have two, two different homes, um, which are really nice and when it's hot out. There's a lot of breeze that comes through. Um, they're also really nice for transporting, so that if, you go, if they're um, going to an area without a lot of vegetation, they can bring um, and transport the materials with them. Um, and they're semi-nomadic, so they kind of move with the seasons from time to time um, throughout the year. The area where I was doing my field site is here in the Lokotipi Plain. Um, it's about 40 kilometers from South Sudan. Um, this is kind of a disputed border. And um, you know, I was kind of based in this area and moved around to different sites. And, um, oh man. Uh, it was all 40 kilometers from South Sudan. And the one way that Turkana men um, can get animals is by conducting raids on members of other ethnic groups. Um, the, the folks where I, um, where I was working, they do mostly raid into South Sudan with a group that called the Deposa. Like 80% of the raids that, that I recorded in my, my job were there. And so it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty hard raiding life. So they have to go about 40 to 80 kilometers through semi-desert area carrying their water. They go by foot um, and their weapons and they go into the Toposa territory and look for animals. Um, and Toposa, and if they find some, they'll they conduct a raid. And if not, they come back. Um, and it can be, they have a lot of the combat exposure. Um, this study by Sarah Matthew, who I was doing this work with, um, found that about half of adult males in this area of Turkana die from um, due to raiding, which is a pretty high mortality rate. And if you think evolutionarily, that's, a pretty, that's pretty important from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, in my study, um, we asked all of the participants um, if they had any visible bullet wounds, which they showed us, which is a really nice measure of combat exposure just because we can see it. Uh, about 50% of, I think it was 48% of the people I interviewed for this study had at least one visible bullet wound. So there's a lot of combat exposure. Um, over the course of the study, we interviewed 200, 218 um, warriors. Um, and the way we did this is we kind of set up our tents in a centralized community. This was near a government dispensary that was occupied maybe about 20% of the time I was there. Um, and there's a few, few people that have like a permit. So you can set that building, that home over there is more permanent. Um, we'd set up tents there. But then we'd go out to various um, communities, some of which are more established than others. And we'd um, go around and try to find warriors to interview. And we basically interviewed anybody we found that was willing to be interviewed. Um, we interviewed a wide range of warriors um, from men such as this man who's fairly old and probably hasn't been raiding for 20, 20 years or more. Um, to young men who had maybe been raiding um, the day before and had been just, was just coming back. Um, the interviews lasted um, anywhere between an hour and six hours, depending on how much combat experience the person we raided have and how much they like to tell stories. Um, and um, by the time the first, uh, the first time I went out, I did a pilot study, and it was pretty much like this, where we just had more of a conversation um, it, with a semi-structured interview. Um, and then by the end, uh, we had five um, research assistants, and we could divide, divide up and interview people like this once the people were trained. Um, we collected a lot of data. We collected demographic data, combat exposure data, data about PTSD symptoms, um, people's moral beliefs, moral injury, which I'll talk about later, and participation in rituals. I'm going to talk about PTSD symptoms now. Um, and the idea is to see, the first part of the study is just to see, do Turkana warriors who live in this small-scale society have the symptoms of PTSD that um, Western, Western or at least American combat soldiers have? Um, the current DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, um, this is the fifth edition. So these are the 20 symptoms that are in the DSM for PTSD. So what 
a psychiatrist does when they interview someone is they go through and see to what extent they have each of these, these symptoms. And I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. Um, things are measured on a Likert scale from zero to four. Um, in our case, we did it from mom jeek, which means not at all, to noy extremely. And the question is, how much has this symptom been bothering you in the last month? So that's the question we asked. So if someone said, like, noy cha, that means quite a bit in English, we would give that score to three. OK. And so the question is, given those questions, do Jakarta warriors have symptoms of PTSD? And um, the answer is, yeah, it seems like they do. Um, and so for each of these questions, we'd ask them how much this is bothering you last month, and we'd also have them describe their symptom. And then we'd translate that into English and have clinicians look at it. And the clinicians would say like, whether or not they have, this is what, how they describe the symptom is what we're actually looking for. And that just gives a little bit of cross-cultural validity. Um, and um, what this shows on the bottom is that there's 20 different symptoms. They can be between 0 and 4, so the maximum score is 80. And generally, in, for a Western population, anything above or equal to 33, a score of 33 is considered a provisional diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, we're not clinicians, so we can't actually give someone a diagnosis, but we can do this provisional diagnosis. And about 28% um, of our participants scored high enough for that. Um, and you, know, you can debate about you know, the cross-cultural validity of the threshold, like we debated a lot. Um, but Going through and like listening to people's stories and their symptoms and the recordings we have, it's pretty clear that these symptoms that people are reporting are, are similar to what, um, what we're asking them to report. Um, and actually, this was somewhat of a surprising result um, for, at least for Sarah. I didn't have strong prior, but she's been working with people a while, and she thought that they would have really low level PTSD. Um, American combat veterans coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan, and these are people that actually have seen combat, it's generally around 12 to 14 percent. So this is about double that. But again, the grain of salt here is that, you know, whether that threshold, whether like mom jeek actually means quite a bit, you know, is there's some debate about that. So I'm going to go into a little bit of like how we're trying to address, address that next. Um, and basically, we're going to do that by comparing symptoms within groups. OK, so, so that being said, so there seems to be this initial question is like, it seems like Turkana at least have um, some of the symptoms of PTSD that we see in Western soldiers. And so the next question, because we're evolutionary anthropologists, is what are the evolutionary origins of, of combat stress? Um, and so I briefly showed you these symptoms. I'm going to go into these a little bit of detail, these 20 symptoms. And this is kind of the, 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 reclass the classification that um, psychologists and psychiatrists use to classify PTSD symptoms. Um, it's not really based on a lot other than and it changes every time they come out with a new edition of the DSM. Um, but it's kind of based on how people feel like these things should go together and a little bit of PCA. Um, and so we have this one idea that um, from evolutionary psychology that, that these symptoms are thought to be genetically adapted. And um, if you go into the literature, um, Cantor has this paper where he kind of goes into this. There's basically um, a subset of these symptoms that he comes up with good, what he calls adaptive explanations for PTSD, um, which are some, all the re-experiencing re symptoms and a couple of the heightened arousal. Um, and for example, here's a re-experiencing symptom called flashbacks. And this is the question we asked. Um, first, we had to ask them to describe their most stressful raid. And this is how clinicians do it. They ask people to describe their most stressful combat experience. Um, and then we say, ask, after the raid, did you have a sudden feeling or start acting as if the raid were actually happening again, as if you were actually reliving it? So this is the idea of a flashback that you're reliving a uh, traumatic experience. Um, and this is one of the answers from one of the Participants, he says, I once arose suddenly from sleep and started shooting my gun abruptly without caring where. Pup, pup, pup. Other people came in, grabbed the gun, and pulled me down. I thought the previous death scenario was happening again. People came in and said it was not happening again and to calm down. Others thought that I was having educopy. Educopy is a word that means total confusion. And the um, sort of the evolutionary psychology explanation for this type of flashbacks is that you know, if someone has one traumatic experience, then they might not learn from it. But if they have some sort of cognitive mechanisms that makes them re-experience the thing over and over again, then they begin to learn and build up um, and learn from just one experience instead of having to experience something multiple times to learn from it. Um, another type of um, symptom, this one's called hypervigilance. It says, after the raid, did you feel jumpy or easily startled? So this is a, a startle response. Um, 
Anytime I hear anything, I suspect it is an enemy. I become alert and careful to make sure it is not. I prove it is a tree, then I keep moving. Hearing an animal running away, yum, 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 I make sure it is an animal before I continue. So this is someone who's like hyper vigilant, who's always thinking about like the enemy might be nearby, even if they're in safely in their own Draconna territory. Um, and then the idea here from the evolutionary, sorry, um, from the evolutionary standpoint, evolutionary psychology standpoint, is that um, being hyper vigilant, if you're in an environment where there are traumatic things can happen all the time, might make a lot of sense because then you're always prepared for something bad to happen and you might be um, trying to avoid it. Um, here's another type of symptom of avoidance. Um, the question here is, um, which I didn't write, the question here is, how do you avoid people, places, um, things, or activities that remind you of, of the raid? And the person said, I decided to leave, um, this person's talking about a place that they're avoiding. I decided to leave um, that place of the battle so that nobody would see me there again. I migrated somewhere else because I would not stay where my animals were raided by the enemies, a place where my people were killed. I would not stay in that place ever again. So this symptom makes, makes a lot of sense if you're thinking from an evolutionary standpoint because you have folks that had a place where they were living where there was a traumatic experience happening and now they have this psychological mechanism to avoid that place. Um, but here's a, here's a different um, answer to that question from a different participant. I avoid reminders of the raid to the extent of throwing away the knife that I had taken from the raid. I threw it away knowing that it was the one that had been used to kill many people. Why should I possess it then? So for this one, the evolutionary story is a little bit less clear because that knife didn't cause the raid. It's probably not going to cause you any problems in the future, but also a knife could be really useful um, for you to keep. So why, why throw that away? That seems like a little bit like a, a maladaptation. Um, you know, and so for that reason, um, there are two symptoms that, um, one, insomnia, which I think everyone that's the road most evolutionary says is maybe not a very good, um, it's not a very good evolutionary story because it's, it's too broad. You could have, some people have insomnia because they're hypervigilant and some people have insomnia because they have a depressive symptom. Um, the other one is avoiding external reminders, as we just saw. There's some times where that might be, have a good evolutionary story and sometimes where it wouldn't. Um, what I'm going to talk about mostly now, though, are the things where, um, even in the ev psych literature, they say, yeah, we don't have a good explanation for, and these are what kind of get glossed as like being more depressive symptoms. Um, so these are things like um, having negative beliefs about the world, or negative feelings, or losing interest, or being detached from other people in your society, or being generally ir irritable or reckless and having low concentration. Things that there doesn't seem to be necessarily, to, uh, at least people haven't come up with, I think, a good adaptive reason for these things. Um, so here's an example of those. The first is a loss of interest. And it's, the question is, after the raid, did you lose interest in activities that you used to enjoy? So those of you familiar with depression, this is kind of a, a typical type of thing that happens in depression. And the answer is, um, I abandoned everything that my other age mates who were not involved in the raid did. I kept away from them and chose to stay away from the area. Even while they were playing, I would just stare at them. So again, not, not necessarily a really straightforward evolutionary explanation for this. Um, and there are lots of other these types of depressive symptoms where you know, it seems like what's going on is a question. All right, so what um, we ended up doing was we did a symptom by symptom comparison between Turkana and US combat veterans. So we got a data set from some VA researchers, which are basically like people that have come back from combat in Iraq or Afghanistan and have taken um, this the, the English version of the same instrument that we, we use to measure um, PTSD and Turkana. And we um, basically took each symptom individually and plotted how many people um, or what fraction of each population said either a two or higher that they were bothered by that symptom. Um, the reason we've done it, another way we just did total score, which works out. But one issue is that um, the Turkana sample tends to answer zeros and fours a lot, a lot more often. So their distributions look really, look really um, convex. And the um, Western population tends to have a mode around three and looks a lot more concave. So it's just, it's really hard to compare the distributions. So we just cut it off at two or higher, which is actually what clinicians use when they do presence absence for each symptom. So we just took what they do and applied it to both. And actually turned out the means were about the same and the standard devi deviations were about the same once we chunked into two categories. Um, and so what this is is for each category, um, you know, so for example, um, negative beliefs about half of American veterans answered a two or higher for that symptom, and about half of Turkana warriors answered 
two or higher for each of those symptoms. And so what this also lets us do is it lets us compare um, with, you're comparing um, the Likert scale between symptoms and not just between groups. So you can kind of get a sense of how relatively within a group they have each symptom. Brooke? So just to yeah. So this, the end of 62 for this, so at least then only people who have been that who were provisionally diagnosed who you did, did Right. Before? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Brooke. Yeah, so the, the, the thing is that the, uh, the American veteran sample is way skewed high because it's people that are in the VA getting mental health care. So the, the, so if you just, we took that cutoff of 33 and that's, that's who we're using. So that's why the Trachonda sample is 62 and the, that's a really big data set. There's 701 in that data set. Um, and it made the, and it worked out that the means and standard eaves were, were pretty much the same. So we just, we didn't really do any more um, massaging it after that. But thanks Brooke for clarifying that. Okay, and so, oh, wrong way. All right, so the first group here, which are these um, triangles, I think they're blue. I'm colorblind. It was either blue or purple, but the triangles are um, things that had the you know the evolutionary explanations that the that are already the F-psych folks have already come up with, um, and those things tend to be fairly high, and they're about the same between the two. Um, the the rest of them are the ones that didn't have necessarily a good explanation. Um, the squares are ones that were kind of ambiguous. Um, you see some of them that are fairly similar between the two groups in the scores, and then there's this this whole group over here um, that are that are different, right? So the trachana tend to have those symptoms at a, lower, at a lower rate, and those symptoms tend to be more of the depressive symptoms. And so the question is like, why, you know, why is it like that? Um, so part of it is that you know, these triangles, you know, if you think that this is a universal response to um, PTSD and has a good you know, kind of genetic standard evolutionary explanation, then, you know, then the fact that, that it seems to be fairly common and also similar between the two groups kind of is supportive of that um, hypothesis. Um, but then, you know, this question is like, why did Trachana suffer these less? Um, and so what I'm going to talk about next is a possible explanation for this, which is this thing called moral injury, which is a, um, a new diagnosis, fairly new. This is the first paper in 2009. And this is the idea that clinicians have who are basically interviewing combat veterans, so this doesn't include survivors of other types of trauma, and they realize that there's some differences between combat veterans and other types of trauma, um, especially in some of the symptoms that were different than the trachana. And the way they define moral injury is it's a uh, reaction to uh, perpetrating, witnessing, or failing to prevent acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. Um, and this is, um, this is a paper by a, someone who's written a book about this that is from the um, on the Huffington Post, but it's a little bit unclear how much this is um, an alternative explanation for PTSD, how much it's a completely separate thing, and how much they overlap. So the clinician, there's a uh, special issue coming out in a clinical journal trying to like, get at these issues. Uh, but there's some idea that there's some PTSD symptoms that are definitely PTSD, some things that are definitely moral injury, which is th these ideas of um, alienation, regret, grief, and shame, and there's some things that might be um, both. Um, when I first did the slide a year and a half ago, there were two books about moral injury that I had on it. Um, and I updated this about six months ago and I ran off space. And so this is something that's really been exploding in the clinical literature and, and now in the popular press literature in the last few years, which is um, all about like why soldiers get moral injury and how to treat it. Um, and you know, we think this goes a long way to explaining kind of this combat stress in these people who are in this kind of safe environment and they, um, this is sometimes called killing in high definition. And so the idea here is these drone pilots are going and they're um, dropping bombs or rockets into, um, on the combat missions and they have these high definition cameras where they can, they lord over the target. So unlike a, like a normal fighter pilot or bomber pilot who drops the bomb and then just flies away, you know, their, their drone is loading over and they can see the death and destruction that they wrought. And this is one of the issues that might be causing um, them to have these PTSD-like symptoms that what they're really experiencing is this moral injury because um, they're going to work every day and instead of doing them, they're going home to their families and you know, having dinner and um, it could create, you can maybe see how that could create some sort of, um, some sort of issue. Um, so as good evol evolutionary anthropologists, we're gonna talk about that. This is a uh, paper that I wrote with Sarah Matthew a few years ago um, where we talk about the evolution of human warfare and I'm gonna talk about how this might apply to PTSD and moral injury. Um, the first point here is that genetic selection should really discourage people from participating in high-risk 
um, areas like warfare. And the idea here is that you could die, and dying is not that great for passing on your genes um, in combat. Um, in chimpanzees, um, Richard Wrangham has what he calls the imbalance of power hypothesis, which is basically this idea that chimpanzees take very little risk when they engage in air group conflict. Um, as far as I know, um, there aren't any recorded instances of uh, attacking chimpanzee being injured in any of this um, intergroup conflict. And even, though, and even though it can be lethal for um, the chimpanzee on the defensive, uh, it's really low risk for chimpanzees on the offensive. Um, humans, however, we sometimes engage in large-scale, high-risk combat where people have a fairly good chance of dying. Um, Dracana, it's 50%. Um, a lot of that is offensive. And um, you know, what's the explanation for this? Um, Sarah and I think this is, can be explained by cultural evolution, um, where people are relying on their cultural inheritance instead of their generic inheritance for um, rules about engaging in a group conflict. And the, and the basic, read our paper for the full story, but this is the basic outline, is that um, you have culture which invents moral norms, and these norms are stabilized by institutions. Um, specifically in the case of pastoral warfare, um, Sarah and Rob Boyd have a paper where they document the institutes, um, institutions of punishment in the Tricana that reinforce participation in warfare. And uh, um, Luke Wacky and Richard Wrangham have um, a paper um, where in the Negatom, um, they say that there's these institutions of rewards where people that participate in combat get rewards from the enemies. And what these end up doing is these are cultural institutions that reinforce behavior that uh, might otherwise be bad for your genes. Um, and one of the evolutionary things about punishment and rewards is that they can have important genetic fitness consequences. So if you're punished a lot, it might be bad for you passing on your genes, or if you reward a lot, it might be good for passing on your genes. And what this creates um, is what Chudik and Henry call a norm psychology, which is um, that we are predisposed when we're born to learn the particular norms of our society and adhere to them because if we don't, then that could have important genetic consequences. Um, and if participating in warfare, like for example, a Tricana, um, is something that um, you get rewards for more cattle or you get punished if you don't participate or you free ride, then that could have important genetic consequences that could outweigh just the risks of fighting in warfare in general. Okay, so in, in summary, genetic selection can invent mechanisms to avoid traumatic events like combat. Um, and, the, and, and those could be the symptoms of PTSD we talked about earlier. And that we might expect these mechanisms to be more universal and context independent. And cultural selection can invent social norms that encourage and govern war. And we might expect these norms to be more cross-culturally variable. And gene cultural co-evolution invents mechanisms to avoid immoral norm violations. Um, and this, we think, could be, can explain some moral injury symptoms and some of the symptoms of PTSD that don't have genetic, obvious direct genetic consequences. Okay, and so an important question then is why might it be that moral injury-like symptoms are lower in the Dracana? So I'm gonna talk about some of the moral beliefs about killing in the Dracana. So one question we asked um, all our participants, I keep on pushing too many buttons, all right, we ask is, who is it permissible to kill during a raid? So we, one of the things that seems to be common in moral injury studies in combat soldiers is that killing seems to be something that is really um, one of the main causes of moral injury, like someone's killed someone in battle and how they respond to it. So the, here we're just getting at like, what are the moral norms surrounding killing? So, um, and here we ask, who is it permissible to kill during a raid? So this is someone goes in and raids uh, Taposa or another enemy group and um, almost everyone says that killing an adult man or an older boy, which is generally like an like older teenager to maybe someone in their young 20s, uh, is fine. Um, younger boys, a little fewer. But then you know, there's a lot of variation between you know, in most of the categories of female and an elderly man. So what we see here is there is a lot of um, variation um, outside of killing men about who you can kill during the raid um, in a society. Um, but what we also find is that the actual number of what we call moral violations is pretty low. So this is, we asked um, <coughs> warriors who they've killed, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of social stigma associated with, with any of this. Um, and we have evidence of that, which I'm not going to go into. But 72% um, of the warriors in our sample had reported killing somebody in battle. 71% um, of people, so almost all of them, said they had killed an adult male. And then a few other people had killed people from other demographic groups. Um, and so, um, and those tend to be fairly low. So like up to 8% is the, is the highest. And um, 
what we also found is the number of people who said it was not okay to kill someone of a different group generally did not kill someone from the demographic group. So, um, very, so this is, I think this is green, maybe this, this green color here, um, is the um, people who had said, for example, um, it's not okay to kill an old woman during a battle, but it actually killed an old woman. So there's like one person out of our, we asked this of 100, 101 people, so like one person out of the 101 person people said that. Um, and actually most of those greens are the same, the same subject. Um, who was a pro prolific killer who had a change of heart about it. Um, so it's a, uh, even though there are these, the, the, the take home message here is even though you have these, these norms and these, um, these moral beliefs about who's okay to kill and they tend to be very high, like at least by our standards for a lot of demographic groups, um, the actual number of people actually doing the killing and then um, violating their, their, their own ideas about the norms tends to be very low. Um, and we think that this, shows that you kind of have a lot of moral autonomy, uh, autonomy in what they're doing. Um, and so we asked some questions about this. Um, these are vignettes. Um, we asked this to 101 um, participants. And it says, um, here's a vignette. Oedipal is a leader of a large raid. Before going on the raid, uh, many Chicana warriors gathered to discuss the raid. Ekelele said, on this raid, let us kill all, any of the enemy, including the elderly, the women, and the small children. Awoy disagreed and said, we should kill only the men, but we should not kill the elderly, the women, or the small children. So what you hear is you have a meeting. Um, generally, these are eight, the leaders of different age sets that come together to discuss the tactics for a raid. And during the pilot, I found out that sometimes they have discussions about who they can kill. Um, and when I started asking about this during the pilot, almost every single time, uh, sorry, every single time that I asked what ended up happening, what was the decision, the raid leader would say, um, we're going to leave it to the warrior's personal choice. So like. Some people would say we should kill everybody, or we, we can kill everybody. Some people say we should just kill the men. And the raid leader ends up just compromising and say we should do the personal choice. Um, when we asked the warriors what should the leader decide, um, you know, 57% said they should kill only the men. 40 so percent said they should kill any, they can kill any enemy. And 4% said let the warriors decide. So what this indicates to us is that even though this seems to be the most common outcome where the raid leader splits the difference, um, where let's each where it's personal choice, people have a preference one way or the other. Um, and, and what it shows is that you know, even though um, people have preferences one way or the other, what ends up happening in practice is that people have a lot of moral autonomy, and which might not happen in, say, American combat unit where you, know, you might have orders to follow, and, that, and they're lawful orders, and you may or may not disagree, but you're expected to carry that out. Um, in the Dracana, the raid leaders don't have any really coercive power. They're mostly there just to coordinate um, actions. And so they don't have that kind of um, ability to impose norms on the group. Um, sanctioning institutions. Um, oh, yeah. Sarah wanted me to add this to let everyone know that um, there's sanctioning institutions in the Tricana. So I'm going to talk about how there's some lacks of sanctioning institutions. But these are just some things that Tricana sanction over. Killing other Tricana is really bad. Um, there's lots of social sanctioning if someone kills another Tricana in a raid or outside a raid or in a personal violence. Um, Conducting raids against other Turkana, it like hardly ever happens at all. Um, and if it does, it's just a couple of guys grabbing a goat and trying to sneak away with it. There's no violent raiding between Turkana. Even though there are millions of Turkana, some of which live far away, and raiding them would be very easy. It just doesn't really happen. There's strong social norms against it. Um, Cowardice of free riding during a raid is there's strong social sanctioning, which just means, um, well, um, arguing over the distribution of animals or, or getting an unequal distribution, there's sanctioning against that. And violating diviner instructions is something I found in my study that there's a good amount of sanctioning in. So this is like a diviner will go and say, on the raid, do these things. And then if someone violates that, often there's sanctioning. So there's lots of sanctioning in the Dracano, and these, they seem, seem to be well enforced, the norms from the sanctioning. Um, and so one of the questions we asked is, there, is there sanctioning about killing in battle? What am I doing on time? OK, I'm doing OK. Um, all right, so these are three different vignettes that have slightly, slight differences. Um, the first one is, during the meeting before the raid, the raid leader decides that the warriors should not kill elderly, elderly people. However, during the raid, a warrior, Essacone, personally kills an elderly woman. Would anyone punish Essacone for not following the raid leader's decision? Um, so here we're trying to get at, is there sanctioning about, not, about violating at least a temporary norm about killing an elderly woman um, on purpose? And, 15% um, said there would be sanctioning, which is fairly low, and 85% said there would not be. Like, no one would, would punish or otherwise sanction that person. 
uh, on, I should say punishment in these instances is almost always like severe beatings or losing animals. So your age mates will get together and make you um, give your animals to somebody else or kill your most prized bull and everyone eats it um, in front of you. So those are kind of like the standard ways that sanctioning happens. Um, the second one is during a meeting before a raid, the raid leader decides that the warriors should not kill elderly people. So the same situation. However, dur oh, so in this case, the raid leader is deciding they should. Oh, yeah, okay. However, during the raid, warrior Mayen kills an elderly woman by chance when shooting into the compound. So this is, so in this case, Mayen didn't purposely kill. It was just someone got caught in the crossfire. Um, and here, only 2% of people said that anyone would punish Mayen for this. And I should say these two people um, also answered punishment for here and here. Um, and they're the only two people that answered punishment for both these ones. Um, so they just really like punishing those two people. Um, and then, so for the most part, like doing something on accident is not considered like no one really wants to punish you except for those two. Um, and then last one is during a meeting before another raid, the raid leader decides that the warriors will kill all enemies, including the elderly woman. However, during the raid, Lubuin decides not to kill an elderly woman he finds in the enemy's compound. Would anyone punish Lubuin for not following the raid leader's decision? So here, 16% um, said they would, they would not, they would punish Lubin for um, not killing when the raid leader said they should kill, um, which is a different, so 13% in the, 13% of those and 14% of these are different people, because it's just those 2% that like punishing. So this kind of indicates to me, I mean, without being, we'll go back and ask, which we'll probably do at some point, is that um, there's just some people that really like killing and some people that really don't like killing and will say there's punishment. But the thing about the Dracana is like, the punishment's really collective. It's hard if you have a group of people and only 15% of people endorse punishment, it's really hard for punishment to happen. You normally, what, how punishment works is people's age mates, who are people about the same age, um, get together and decide. Um, and it might be very quick, but they decide collectively about whether they're going to either beat someone or make them do something with their animals. And so it's really hard if you have um, 10 people and only one of them endorses punishment, it's probably not going to happen. So what this says is that yeah, there aren't a lot of people endorsing sanctioning is the thing that happens when people violate these moral beliefs, but it also means that even if there are people, there doesn't seem to be enough of them where, the, where this type of sanctioning would actually occur. Um, so in, in, the, in the case of moral injury, it kind of indicates there doesn't seem to be really strong sanctioning and forcing moral norms about who it is okay or not okay to kill, which could explain a lot of this variation we're seeing in people's ideas about their, their beliefs about who it's okay to kill or not. All right. Okay, so the next part is um, talking about how Tricana might be different than Western, is that Tricana have what Sarah and I are calling community, community signaling institutions. Um, and these are institutions that help convey to the warrior that what they're doing is morally right and good and not going to um, be um, sanctioned. It's not going to be violating moral belief. Um, there, one of them is there's a Akinyak, which is a, a warrior dance that's sometimes done before big raids. Um, and it kind of um, involves a lot of the community. So here um, there are Tracana women who are, are dancing and singing and um, the men are kind of play, play fighting. And it's a community celebration. It doesn't happen before every raid, but it kind of gives a signal that like what you're about to do is supported by the community. Um, specifically for killing, which is something we're focusing on, there are three separate rituals that, that a warrior can go through if they have killed during a raid. The first one is uh, called Akapur, and what this is is a ritual purification. So if someone's killed um, an enemy during a raid, um, they um, participate in this ritual that only involves um, men who have also killed in battle. So normally there's someone who leads the ritual who is um, someone well respected who is in the community who is killed in battle, and all the men who participate are invited to the ceremony are men who have already gone through the ceremony and, and killed in battle. Um, and the second, and this one is considered pretty mandatory. So if you ask people, like, what happens if you don't go through this one, they say, oh, you know, if you were, whatever reason you didn't do Akapur, then you'll slowly waste away and become weaker and weaker until you die or you go through the ritual. And so this is um, considered pretty mandatory um, by everybody. Um, the second one is a Nidabus. A Nidabus is a protection from ghosts. So what, what can happen if someone kills during battle is that they can be haunted by the ghosts of their, um, the enemies they've killed. And this is often, um, and this is actually um, the, 
the cross-cultural psychologists think this is like something fairly universal that we don't talk a lot about in Western medicine, this idea of being haunted by ghosts as a, um, as a response to trauma. Um, and Nidibus is not considered mandatory, but um, almost everyone does it. Basically, it's the same people that are going to be there that are there for Akabor, Akabor, so men that have killed. It's often done at the same time, like preemptively, but also it can occur when someone's haunted by ghosts maybe years or decades after the event. Um, there was one man that I interviewed who um, had gone through Nidibus, he thought like maybe 10 or 12 times. So like he would go through it and then the ghost would go away and then maybe a year or two later the ghost would come back and then he'd re-experience that again and then he would get, his, um, get a, the men together to, to redo the ritual. Um, and then the last one of these is um, Akagare. And Akagare is ritual scarring. Um, you can see, I don't know how you can see on this monitor, but this uh, warrior has, um, has scars and the scars come are um, for people who have killed in battle. Uh, and basically this ceremony is really painful and involves a hook and they like dig it into the skin and pull it off and slice with razor blades. And so um, I think this, this, this uh, man had killed one person in battle. And so when he went through this ceremony, you know, that's is, is a pretty painful thing. Um, about, this is definitely considered optional. I think like 30% of the people who had killed in our, in our uh, study had gone through this. Um, if you ask people why they don't, they say, the old men, a lot of the old men have gone through it. So I think it's become much more optional for the younger men. Um, why they don't go through it. Um, some people say it's because it hurts a lot and it's really painful and I don't want to do that. Um, some of them say um, that it's just showing off, that you know the only reason to do this is to um, show off to other people how great I am at them, and they, they say they're more humble than that. Or um, some people say it's because um, I don't want to be marked by the enemy as someone to kill. Um, and one thing about the Turkana is they do actually spend a lot of time with the Taposa during peacetime, which happens you know, a couple times a year, peace breaks out, and they'll like, get together and sing stories and songs. And actually have a lot of, some of them have really good friends in the Taposa who they then fight with. And, um, but they, they think, like, if I have all these scars, then when we're with the Taposa during peacetime, they're going to remember, oh, this guy's a killer, and we need to make sure we get him there during the next battle. So that's one of the reasons why not. They don't do it. Um, but in general, like, Akagar is also only for killers. And I asked people, like, what happens if someone is Akagar and they didn't actually kill somebody? And there was, almost everyone said that was a bad thing to do. Um, and it um, is definitely an open single to your community. And we also asked, like, what do you think of someone with Akagar? Akagar? And almost everyone said, um, we didn't have anyone say there was a negative association with someone with scars. It was either neutral or positive, where some people didn't really care one way or the other, but, everyone else, but most people in the community, men and females, said that someone with Akagar was, they respected them and thought highly of them. Um, and so this is, um, all three of these, and especially the last one, I think are symbols, um, are, are institutions or rituals that signal to the society that like what you did killing in battle is, um, socially accepted and, and if not morally right, at least morally accepted by the society. Um, and one thing, you know, the difference between this and Western soldiers is that, um, you know, I was, in the, I was in the military for a few years and you know, there isn't really a, um, there aren't really mechanisms for if you've killed in battle, any sort of acceptance of that. Um, you know, even like the medals people win like for combat are generally about saving lives you might have killed during that, but it's like always incidental to something else, like co accomplishing a mission or saving lives um, and putting yourself at risk are, are the main reasons why we reward things. And there isn't, I'm not saying we should, um, well, actually, this is the next one. Um, I'll talk about now. Um, and so, and I'm not saying that that'd be a good idea, like if you're interested in preventing moral injury to have institutions that reward killing, but, at le but I think that, you know, if this is something we're actually interested in preventing, then um, then having institutions that at least accept, that show acceptance of that is something that someone had to do during their mission and, um, and you know, some sort of somber. And anyway, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to talk about it later. This is, this is fairly new. Okay, communities. Oh, the other thing about Turkana is there's community support. Um, so one thing about the, the men is um, almost everyone in, we interviewed except for the really young guys, had been on offensive raids, so they'd gone and fought the enemy. Um, the really young guys, some of them had only been there when the Turkana were attacked. And um, by the time someone gets to be middle-aged or old, almost everyone has at least some, if not a lot, of raid experience. They've, they've killed, they've seen people die, they have um, um, have seen their friends die and maybe their family. Um, but 
you know, when you have men get together and they can talk, a lot of what they talk about is raiding and it's just part of their society. Where here in the US, we send people over to Iraq or Afghanistan and they um, fight in combat and they come home to a civilian society where most people are disconnected from what they've done and they don't have the, the opportunity necessarily to process this. Um, there are, um, in the VA, they have programs where they have group therapy where they try to get veterans together to talk about it, but it doesn't really like influence their society. Uh, when we have, we have groups of men together and we're hanging out, and like what are, men are talking about, sometimes you know, marriages or animals or where to, to forage, but a large percentage of what they're talking about, at least based anecdotally on my experience, is about raiding and, and going on raids. And it just becomes part of um, their everyday discourse, uh, which I think also helps them deal with the process, the, the moral and the ethical issues of what they're dealing with just through conversation. Um, sorry, and I got into this a little bit earlier, but this is um, fairly new. Sarah and I just wrote a paper for clinicians so, um, about you know, maybe some possible recommendations to look at. Um, some are, um, you know, if there were a way, I'm not sure how to do this, but if there were a way to allow American combat soldiers to have more, more moral autonomy, um, to do things that they're comfortable or less comfortable with based on their own moral beliefs, that might be something that might help alleviate PTSD um, in American combat vets. Um, also, if there was some way of having these signaling institutions, so like I was going off on the tangent earlier about, you know, if you had different ceremonies or procedures for folks who kill in combat to process that in a group setting where it signals to them that what they did is morally acceptable to the group um, would be helpful, which I don't think there currently is anything like that, at least not formally. And the last one is um, having somehow to have more of a, a community where when people come back from battle or come back from Iraq or Afghanistan, they have the ability to process this with other veterans who have similar experiences, which I think the VA tries to do to some extent, but it's fairly limited. It may be not looked at from the kind of evolutionary perspective that, that we do. Um, all right, so I'm almost done, but I'm gonna talk about a couple of places we're going with this research. Um, right now I'm still processing a lot of the data. Um, one thing we did is um, we checked, looked for cortisol sensitivity differences in Turkana with warriors with high or low um, PTSD symptoms. In, in Western soldiers, people seem to think, the studies are a little bit mixed, but people seem to think that cortisol sensitivity is a lot lower for people that have PTSD, um, which is um, cortisol, it can be like a, a stress response in this case. Um, but working with you know, Ben Trumbull's lab at ASU has done a lot of the analysis, but we've collected these samples and we're gonna see, um, I wanna pre-register it, so I haven't looked at the data yet, but we're gonna see if the cortisol sensitivity is also lower in the Turkana, which if it is, would give some evidence that at least we're looking at kind of similar um, biochemical phenomena, and if it isn't, that might be interesting too. Um, and also, one thing that I dis discovered um, in my second field season was that um, women have a, a larger role in in intergroup raids then, especially when the Turkana attacked then um, previously known about. Um, and this is probably something that seems to be, um, I don't know if it's unique to the Turkana, but talking to anthropologists that with other groups seems to not be the case. Um, in um, a lot of the killing um, of enemies when the Turkana attacked it is actually done by women, it turns out. So if someone gets injured or disarmed or otherwise incapacitated, um, then um, Turkana women are actually the ones that come out um, most of the time and kill them um, with either basically clubs or, or, stone, or stones them to death, which is you know, pretty severe. And some women are really, just in our interviews, are really gung-ho about that. And some of them are really um, don't like this idea at all. And so one thing we're, um, and we've collected some data, but we're um, really interested in looking at PTSD and moral injury in, in the women um, based on this too. Um, the other thing is that we are really interested in doing a larger cross-cultural sample. Um, in two days, we're doing a workshop at ASU um, Center for Evolutionary Medicine, where we have something on the order, um, Dan's gonna participate remotely, but we're gonna do something on the order of seven um, to eight anthropologists and some clinicians to get together and try to do a cross-cultural sample where, one, we actually have clinicians involved, which I think will be good, but also we can um, look at this type of stuff more across different societies and maybe be able to tangle apart some of these different things that we think are different between Turkana and Western groups. Um, all right, this is my thank you slide. Um, our funder's on the bottom, and then our, we couldn't have done any of this work without our, our amazing research assistants who um, have done, um, been involved in all of the interviews, but also, um, at least for me, my first time being in the field, gave me like invaluable insights and experiences um, talking to people. All right, so here's my summary. Um, is PTSD universal? Is a, is a big question out there. Um, we did this study with Turkana warriors. And it seems that they have a lot of the symptoms of PTSD that um, Westerns 
uh, people in Western societies do, which is um, something that maybe was unexpected. Um, however, they seem to have lower symptoms of, of, that we associate more with this new thing called moral injury that the clinicians are coming up with. Um, and we think from an evolutionary standpoint that PTSD and moral injury may have different kind of evolutionary paths. Those type of symptoms have different evolutionary paths. Um, we did a, um, and that moral injury might stem from kind of a norm psychology where people are violating moral norms um, and are trying to avoid that because it creates sanctions of punishment or avoid rewards. And we think that there could be some things about Dracon institutions um, that may limit moral injury. We try to research a lot of the social sanctioning and moral beliefs about the Dracana and how that relates to, um, in how that, in how that relates to their moral beliefs. Um, but there's more work to do there. All right, that's it. So if anyone has any questions, I think it was about an hour. Yeah. about with other mood disorders, this idea that how we define the disorder is sometimes by its symptoms, but then sometimes it's by its cause, and sometimes, you know, there are all these different ways that we do, and so it's interesting that PTSD, um, of course, is a, was a, is a disorder that was initially defined by its cause, because it was right. shell shock, it was, right, this idea of, um, like, post-combat stress, um, but we now use the same term and the same diagnosis for victims. Right, right, that like right. PTSD is something that any trauma can bring about. So I was wondering right. if you have any opinions about that, whether yeah. whether you're the perpetrator or the victim either should be separated out, whether these are um, adaptive responses to one versus the other, or whether this is something that you define more by its symptoms. Right. Yeah, you know, it's inter so, yeah, that's really interesting. I think, you know, I'm coming to this whole clinical world from outside, and really for the most part, PTSD is like the only exception. The clinicians don't care about cause for, for these types of disorders. It's mostly about going through, I mean, this is what you're getting out of it, but like it's basically most of the DSM is like going through and just like counting symptoms up and seeing if people have these symptoms, like depression or, um, you know, whatever the different things are, and people have yes or no, what's the treatment, right? And so PTSD is this weird one for clinicians because you actually have a cause that's required to have it. Um, and moral injury, like the instruments for moral injury right now are all about causes. They don't actually have symptoms, which is kind of frustrating for us. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's, I think that, you know, we're looking at symptoms and I think it's because we're trying to like get at the, what causes these symptoms in, in Western soldiers. I think that the, the anthropologists have, have probably a better idea, which is you, they go in and try to take these things on their own terms and don't worry about symptoms so much. Just think about how people conceptualize it. Um, but I think, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of way off the tangent of your question, but, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a mess. And so we're, we have this idea that these are, these are just like kind of two different classes of symptoms and that if we went in and like actually thought about it from an adaptive standpoint, from gene cultural coevolution standpoint, or even actually evolutionary <coughs> psychology standpoint, and I think Randy, we kind of disagree with Randy a little bit about PTSD specifically, but I think the general approach is that we could kind of like think about the ultimate causes of these things, not just the, the traumatic experience, and be able to reclassify things and maybe think about treatments differently that address symptoms based on like maybe their evolutionary history. And we're far, we're far from that at this point. That's kind of where we want to aim. Um, I think as far as moral injury versus PTSD or perpetrators versus tra people doing different types of trauma, um, my kind of like rough hypothesis to start is that Things that are like a general reaction to traumatic experience, I think would be kind of more universal. So this could be interpersonal violence or, or natural disasters and things, these kind of things that were in the upper left on that one graph. I would think that those things might be just really more context independent, but I think the moral injury thing really, um, if these symptoms are caused by moral, more moral injury type symptoms, I think that you really have to get into the weeds for a specific society and even a specific person about um, whether um, that symptom is caught, what that symptom is caused by. I don't know if that answers. Okay, thanks, Mark. Yeah. Um, first off, thank you. It's really interesting. Um, so I was, you know, a, a thought occurred to me that in in sort of like a, you know, a, a model of cultural evolution of a society where you have these moral norms, um, mm -hmm. that a stable equilibrium would be one wherein 
you know, the norms of the society are such that you're not forced to, you know, break those norms in the course of warfare or something like that. Like, right. you know, in a stable equilibrium would be killing is okay, and, you know, killing anybody's okay, and you're in right. the environment, and you kill, and you don't have, you know, moral injury, or you might expect something sort of in the opposite direction, where, like, nope, you can only kill this one category, and there will be rules about how warfare ought to be conducted that will keep you from conducting, you know, engaging that sort of behavior. So I guess, you know, with that in mind, my question is about the extent to which Western society is sort of structured in a way that allows for specialization and the development of norms within institutions that don't reflect the broader culture right. so that you could have norms in the military about killing that don't you know, reflect right. norms in sort of broader American society about right. killing. And if that's the case, do you have sort of predictions about the extent to which there is, you know, hierarchical structure and specialization of right. those sorts of things as compared to a small scale society where everybody's sort of maybe more of a generalist and engaging in all these sorts of things? Yeah, yeah no, I think yeah, to, I'm gonna, yeah, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rephrase a little bit and see if this is what you're getting at. So you're, you're, I think what you're saying is that, you know, in like our society, right, you kind of grow up, most of us, even people that are, end up, even people like me who's in the military, my dad was in the military, right, you kind of grow up in the society where, you know, killing just in general is considered to be bad, warfare is considered to be bad, you know, it's like at best a necessary evil, right, like, like it's evil, but it's like sometimes it's necessary, and I, and across, and some people in their hearts might not agree with that, but like, a, but across like the political spectrum, I think almost everybody, even if they're really a big hawk, would agree with that. Um, kind of conception, but then you you send people to battle and they're committing this necessary evil and they're killing people which might not be sanctioned. Um, whereas, and that's going to be a small subset of people, and then they're going to come back and they're going to be back in a society where war is war is at best a necessary evil. Um, where in the Turkana, war is just more of a part of life. Um, people recognize that, like, I think that if you could somehow abolish war, people would still get their animals. Like everyone would be happy with that, right? Because it's war kind of sucks, but. Um, but it's more of part of their society and they might not have this kind of disconnect between their kind of institutions that they grew up with versus what they're doing when they go off into battle. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, but I, I guess it's about, you know, to the extent that a society is segmented with roles like warrior as distinct yeah. from, you know, civilian, um, you know, in Turkana society it seems like the line there is more blurred, right. whereas it's less blurry. and the institutions that support being a warrior in the United States can evolve norms about how you ought to behave that are right. distinct from you know civilian norms about that. Right. Whereas there isn't really that clear distinction right. in Turkana norms, at least. It's yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah, and, and another thing too, um, which I didn't talk about here, is that our norms about warfare, at least since the last 50 years, have been really codified, um, and so there's. You know, the Geneva Conventions, and there's a whole <coughs> bunch of international treaties. And as someone in the military, you're trained on this like, here's what's allowed, here's what's not allowed. And um, there's, and there's a formal sanctioning procedure. It doesn't always get to follow, but you know, people violate, there's a formal sanctioning procedure. And the Jakarta don't really have that. They don't have like a codified set of norms, so you can see a lot more variation um, what they believe than, than what we do. Yeah. Do you have data on the comparison of symptoms between the uh, drone pilots and the people who? Uh, we're in battle yeah. themselves. I don't I don't have um, I don't have that data. There's like a there was a report that came out and it was more it was more qualitative than I would like. Um, so I don't I don't know if any was done like the type of comparison I did right. here. I, I, I haven't seen it. If it has it's come out since I looked into it a couple years ago. So um, yeah, I wish I, I wish it was out there. It'd be a lot nicer. It'd be a lot nicer for the story anyway. So I have a question from Dan. Um, so if moral injury stems from violation of deeply held moral values, right. and Turkana show less moral injury because norms support killing during raiding, then perhaps moral injury among the Turkana appears not due to killing, but ra rather due to cowardice, which is a severe violation of Turkana norms. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that'd be worth looking into. I don't have data on cowardice. <coughs> Yeah, no, that'd be definitely worth looking into. Yeah, we're gonna, one thing I didn't show because I haven't done it, finished it yet is um, trying to look at predictors of moral injury symptoms based on people's uh, common exposure. But yeah, we didn't ask people if they were a coward. Um, so, but we good to do.
And, and sometimes people would admit it, sometimes not. Like, I've definitely had people tell us they were cowards, volunteer that information. But, yeah. Good point, Dan. <laughs> yeah. So you're suggesting that the between group differences whereby the Turkana show less of the moral injury symptoms um, than do Americans. Within Americans, are, is, is variation in the moral injury symptoms, it does, do we know, is that variation associated with differential moral judgments or perceptions yep. of what other people's judgments are? No, nope, we don't know. We don't know. So th this literature is really new and they don't, anyway, I'm frustrated. I, I kind of wish like a lot of this stuff had been done. So we, um, the paper Sarah and I just wrote is about moral injury, and we like make a lot of recommendations about how we think that it should be studied. I don't know if they'll agree, but like going through basically what we did is like figure out what the moral beliefs are, and 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 collect these type of data to try to do this type of association. And it's as far as I know, it hasn't. If it's been done, it hasn't been published yet. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, sort of reflecting on what people have mentioned. Um, regarding how the, you know, in a Western context, how the, the particular content of the conflict is viewed at home and how that might influence moral injury. Right. So um, have you thought about maybe doing, um, looking at, uh, say, veterans from the Iraq War who participated when the, the, the war was like more favorable yeah. in the general public as opposed to when it wasn't? Yeah, so there's, um, I haven't looked at that, but there's, um, this political scientist named Scott Gartner, um, who was at Davis when I was there, and he, he didn't do with Iraq and Afghanistan, at least not that I've seen, but he did a study um, looking at the Vietnam War about, because public opinion of the Vietnam, it's similar, you know, it kind of um, changed, it went one direction over time, and he, his story is that um, he, looked at, he was looking at suicides and not necessarily PTSD or moral injury, um, and this was a few years ago, and, and he found that like, he made his, he found an association between suicide rates and and um, like less support for the war. It's a little bit hard to tease it apart because it's just you know there could be a lot of colon areas in there, but he did, he just found that that association. Um, so I don't know if anyone's looked at that for Iraq and Afghanistan, but okay. it would like kind of like support that if if you believe that association, then it kind of supports that um, that idea, I think. Um, I was wondering, uh, thank you for your uh, talk, by the way, it's Thanks. very interesting to me. Um, I was wondering if you have any measurements of moral injury um, uh, within the population that you looked at, so that maybe you can associate them with the, well, the PTSD symptoms that were sort of different from the other ones? Yeah, you mean um, moral injury outside of the PTSD associated symptoms? Yes. Yeah, yeah like um, guilt or I don't know. Yeah, we have some. Um, I haven't. It's a little bit tricky because, so right now, and yeah, we have some. We, we, we only did it with 20 some subjects though, and so it's not very great data, because um, we did it at the, like the end when Sarah, um, Sarah went out um, after I did my field site and we added that, um, and she, anyway, so we only have 23, and so it's not really great data. But one of the tricky things is that like the clinicians don't really have a good measure of it, and so it, it, there wasn't anything we could just like translate over. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of like had to fill so it out. So there's not like a, a known structural interview? Or what yeah, there's, there's two moral injury instruments, interview instruments, and both of them focus on causes. And okay. so we're like, oh, did you ever, um, so it'll be like, did you ever um, treat women and children badly in, during in yeah. combat, right? And so, but it's, they don't, there's it's only, about the guilt or yeah, the it's, it's, it's weird. So it's like, yeah. they call it moral injury event scale, and there's the moral injury questionnaire, military version are the two, and they're both really focused on, on events. And so one of the things we argued to clinicians is you really should actually focus on symptoms, <laughs> you know, like, but as well. the data that you have, like the 23 persons, did you see an association? Um, you know, I have to go back and check. I haven't, I haven't uh, <coughs> looked at that so yet. Um, so it could be. So more to come. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Um, so you said, you know, earlier in the presentation that uh, raid leaders generally leave it up to the individuals in the raid to make decisions about right. whether they kill children and women and stuff like that. Right. Um, what do the data on individual differences look like for those who said, like, killing women or killing children is wrong, who then ended up killing children? Do you see higher rates of moral injury with those individuals um, in Turkana, Turkana society? I don't know. Not I don't know yet. So these are regressions that are on my computer that are uh, they're not done yet so um, and I'm also trying to 
Um, I could have looked at that now, but I'm trying to get all of the data clean and all the models that I'm going to run set ahead of time before I actually run them. So, um, and pro probably try to, pre I mean, I've looked at the data, so it'd be kind of weird pre-registration, but I want to do that. So I, that's in there. So more to come on that too, but um, yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Matt. Yes.